Okay guys, so those were obstructive diseases and now we're going to get to restrictive ones. And as I said before, restrictive disease means that the volume of the lungs is decreased and thus the frequency is going to be rather increased. And what I want you to understand is a general view about this. So we talk about decreased volume and either you can imagine scarring in the lungs, you can imagine fibrotic processes that make the lungs constricted and that's why they decrease their volumes and they lost their elasticity and, and compliance or you can imagine something rather reversible as if they get edematous if they get more heavy full of water this also decreases their volumes so either if the lungs get somehow constricted within themselves that means uh, within within the lungs, there's a process in the lungs, or something around the lungs makes them constricted, or if the lungs itself get heavier by fluids, whatever, the, it could be edema, it could be hemorrhage, it could be pus, okay? So in all these cases, lungs get less elastic and thus restricted. So remember, anything that makes lungs heavier, like full of water, or there is some fibrotic process going on, they will lose their elasticity, and that's why also compliance. So let's say less elastic, and that means also less compliant. Okay, and as I already mentioned, we got two main groups. One group of diseases come from the lungs or are located within the lungs. That's why you call them intrapulmonary causes. And then we have causes of restrictions that come around the lungs. That means extrapulmonary causes. So intrapulmonary and extrapulmonary. And these Intrapulmonary, I could still divide into, let's say, to certain point reversible causes. And the other group would be, let's say, rather irreversible or even progressing. So that means in these cases, those are chronic diseases which, which make the lungs less and less compliant. Okay. So more stiff. And what do I mean by reversible? Well, that means every time the lungs get edematous, okay, if they're full of water, and this could be due to, for example, left heart failure, or due to some inflammation, like pneumonia, whatever the cause of the pneumonia would be infectious or non-infectious, doesn't matter. All these causes will cause the lungs to be more heavy and less elastic, okay? So over here we could put lung edema like in general whatever the causes and then to be more specific we can we can write down left heart failure or pneumonia okay so lung edema lung edema and then we can write left heart failure pneumonia okay but this depends. Of course, if you have lung edema and you give diuretics and this solves itself, then it's reversible. Or if someone has a bacterial pneumonia, you give antibiotics and again, it's reversible. Okay. But in case the process, the inflammatory process turns into chronic process and there are already fibrotic changes, then it's irreversible. Okay. And also if you have hemorrhage into the lungs, and also, if you have, for example, pus in the lungs, all of these causes will decrease the compliance of the lungs, and that's why you will have restrictive disease, okay? And then you have the other group, or let's say subgroup, which is like really irreversible, rather irreversible, and mostly progressive disease. And these diseases worsen the situation, make the, the lungs less and less elastic, and basically 
end up, if you're lucky enough, with lung transplantation or that's the last stage. So it progresses, progresses, and the only hope for these patients, most of them, is a lung transplantation. And some go really fast, some slower. It depends. But anyways, over here, I would talk about really one huge group. And you have like more than 100 diseases you could mention already here. And we're going to dedicate a special page for these diseases. And remember, this is a huge group, which is called interstitial lung diseases. And here's a small comment. Remember, in all kinds of these diseases over here, that means the either reversible with the lung edema, etc., or reversible, in all of these cases, rather the, let's say, diffusion capacity, and especially for oxygen and CO2, will be decreased. Although we're going to talk about it, you measure it with DLCO, that's carbon monoxide. And remember, in all of these cases, rather the diffusion DLCO will be decreased. There's one exception in hemorrhage. If you have erythrocytes in the alveoli, like in hemorrhage, this can sort of falsely make the diffusion increased, but this is because how you measure the DLCO. So it could be increased, but don't be mistaken. Of course, the diffusion for oxygen and CO2 is gonna be decreased, but it's the feature of CO, carbon monoxide, that this makes it increased. So the measurement is wrong, not the reality. The diffusions will be decreased for oxygen and CO2. Okay, to repeat it once more. So the diffusion is gonna be worse in all of the intrapulmonary cases, okay? It worsens. But the measurement, because you use carbon monoxide, if you get blood into the alveoli, they attract more CO. So it seems like there's increased diffusion, but in reality, there is not. Because what matters is the thickness of the alveolocapillary membrane. And in case you're having edema or fibrosis, it's thicker. So that's why the diffusion is going to be decreased in all of these intrapulmonary causes. Okay. In contrast to these intrapulmonary causes, then you have the extrapulmonary causes. And in this case, there's nothing wrong with the interstitium, nothing wrong with the lungs itself, because the cause is extrapulmonary. That's why DLCO is going to be normal, okay? And that's, you can use the DLCO in case you have a restrictive disease now. You do the pulmonary function test. And then if you do DLCO, then right away you can sort of think of more if the DLCO is normal, that the diffusion is okay, then you can rather think of extra pulmonary causes. And basically over here, again, it's a group of diseases and there's something with the chest. There's something with the chest movement. And although the lungs are okay, you're not able to expand the chest. And that's why also the compliancy of the lungs is decreased okay, by this factor. So basically, if someone sits on your chest, yeah, you're going to have restrictive disease, okay? And of course, the other and the most common cause in old people is kephoscoliosis, okay? So kephoscoliosis. If you have any kind of severe scoliosis, but kephoscoliosis in the old people, you're going to have problems with restrictive disease. And not only this, of course, if you're going to be overweight okay so obesity of course this decreases the ability of the lungs to expand so obesity and also ascites so patients with cirrhosis is a terrible so with ascites and also pregnancy okay so these obviously mechanic circumstances make your lungs less compliant uh, although the the, the parenchyma is okay and that's why you're, you're having a restrictive disease, okay? And so these are rather like, let's say, mechanical problems. And then you can have a problems with respiratory drive, okay? So it could be something with the control of the respiratory drive or with the, with the neurons that are innovating the diaphragm, okay? So, so then we can think of all the different neurodegenerative diseases or some uh, muscle dystrophies and whatever. So let's write it down. So there's something wrong with the control of the chest to expand. So don't forget, it could be myasthenia gravis. 
It could be ALS, of course, okay, at the end, ALS. There could be something with the phrenic nerve, nerve trauma, okay. And Guylaine Barre, and don't forget, of course, uh, muscle, all kinds of muscle dystrophies. Okay, so these were like general examples. Uh, we went through all the, let's say, extrapulmonary, and we mentioned some general ideas about the intrapulmonary causes. Reversible ones, remember lung edema, okay, left heart uh, failure, of course, this will, this will make the lungs uh, full of blood, and that's why heavy, and that's why less elastic, and that's why restrictive, and of course, don't forget about the huge group of diseases. I said more than 100, some say even 200 diseases, which is one big group, and we call it interstitial lung diseases. And over here, this is about long-term or chronic inflammation and then fibrotic process, okay? So scarring of the lungs, etc., etc. We're going to talk about it right away now. So let's jump to interstitial lung diseases. So... Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. And as always, check the description below for supplementary questions and other materials.